Hello, welcome to Fight Designer LLC. Uh, by request, I know some people have been asking for some more uh, Hema and Sword related stuff. Stage combat, historical European martial arts, how that fits together. Uh, so I thought I'd go ahead and throw one out here while I have the rig set up. Um, apologies, I am fighting off a bit of a cold today, so if, uh, if I sound a little off, that's why. I'll try not to cough on the mic. Um, I thought what I wanted to talk about today is some of the difference in the props and the difference that having a solid historical European martial artist market has made in the availability of what tools we can use in stage combat as well. So I'm going to start today by talking primarily about the Tinker line, the Hanrei Tinker line, but by comparing it to some of the other stuff that we've got, well, we'll touch some other bases as well. So for those of you who don't know, Michael Tinker Pierce is a, a lovely gentleman based um, just outside of Seattle. I got to know him a little bit while I was there. Uh, and he is a custom sword maker. And this was an interesting collaboration that he did with Cass Iberia, uh, which became Cass Hanwe. I'm not sure where in the sequence all of that happened. Um, where he designed these blades for them, uh, and then they, they mass produced them. So it's an interesting combination of sort of custom work and production line work. Um, now, one of the things that makes this most appealing to historical European martial artists is not just the proportions and the balance, but also that you can swap out uh, blades. You can get sharp blades, you can get blunts, you can get fullered and non-fullered versions of some of these as well that'll have slightly different behavior. So this is an example of a sharp uh, Hanwei Tinker Line uh, Bastard Sword. And this is the fullered version. Um, so these are great for those of you who like to do cutting practice, which can be a great way to, to test blade alignment. Um, or like me, if that's just kind of become your family way to uh, cut open watermelons or things like that when the time comes. Um, and these are all attached through the way of a, a nut here, with a, which uses a standard hex wrench. Uh, and here we have an example of the same sword with the uh, blunt line, blunt blade. And as you can see, it's kind of squared off at the end. The idea is that you'd be able to put an uh, uh, archery blunt on there and use this for fencing. Um, so, identical hilt. Identical proportions. This one, the grip, grip started to come unglued after a while, so I, I uh, re-glued it and wrapped it in cord when I did, which is why it's got a bit of a texture, but it was the same hilt. Um, now, in theory, you could be able to swap out these blades anytime you want. So you only have to buy one hilt, you can buy two blades, you can get your cutting practice in, you can get your sparring in, your fencing in, uh, if you're doing armored uh, practice or whatever, uh, at least masking up. Um, now, in practice, it doesn't always work that way, because what I've discovered is quality control is not ideal. I'm going to focus mostly on the blunts because that's what we use in stage combat. Um, now, things I do like about these, these are really light compared to a lot of what some of us kind of cut our teeth on when we were just starting out in stage combat. Um, <clears throat> so if I compare this to a summer's day, let's see, let me go ahead and weigh this using my scale here. All right, I'm not going to tell you how much I weigh. All right, so according to my scale, this weighs three pounds. Now, like I said, I don't trust quality control on these too much, so I'm not going to go by the, the weight that's on the website. I'm not sure I trust my own goodwill scale either, so we'll see. <laughs> but uh, it is light. It is a light blade. Um, I also love the harmonics of it. Now, I don't know if you can, how much of this you can see here, but if you, uh, if you look at the, the places where this sword vibrates or doesn't, you've got one node here, and you've got another node right about where your hand is going to be, which is what you want to be able to, to hit something and not have your hand going blah, 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 the whole time. Right, so it, it feels fairly secure and it's got a nice sort of sweet spot for cutting right here, just a little past the mid blade. Um, it does have distal taper, it does have edge taper, um, so it feels fairly light and responsive. Um, compare that to another sword from the same company, a lot of you might recognize these, the old uh, Hanway Practical Hand and a Halfs. Um, I forget which generation this is, probably a couple generations ago, this is an older one. And these have fairly similar proportions. The hilt's a little longer on the uh, Tinkerline Bastard Sword. Not much. They're very, very similar here. It's, so a little more hilt on the Tinkerline, but about the same. Um, and this one is, according to my scale, this one's about 3.2 pounds. But uh, because that weight is also a little bit further up, um, you've got the slightly shorter handle, it feels a lot chunkier. It's just, it doesn't feel quite as responsive by far. It's also got a much thicker handle, thicker grip. Uh, I found that when I started, I, I was used to this. Um, but as I've gone on, I've gotten more and more fond of these thinner grips as well. Um, that's just kind of a personal preference thing. 
So, um, in terms of stage use, the edges are not that different thickness-wise, um, but one thing I have found that has occasionally been problematic about using these for, for SAFD Broadsword, for example, um, when they are shipped, the edges are not rounded, they're squared off. So what that means is when you first use it, if you don't sand it off or file it a little something first, when you first use it, you can get these little kind of burrs coming off the corners. Um, and that's obviously not safe. Uh, it can be a problem if you're half sorting, you start to do something like that, you can cut yourself if you're doing a draw cut. Um, or even just if things go flying, if you're doing a little deflecting shot, uh, a little chip of metal can go flying, catch somebody in the eye. Not the kind of stuff you want to have to deal with. So I would recommend when you get these, when they're brand new, just take it to a, a little bit of a sander or a file or something and just, just round those edges off to make it a little bit more actor friendly. Um, and I, I think that definitely will help. So if you think about what a lot of us started with being Starfire, and this is one of their somewhat fancier, less crowbar looking ones, this one comes in almost three and a half pounds. So definitely a heavier, uh, um, also definitely a shorter hilt, which is gonna make it feel even heavier still because you have less leverage with which to control and the, uh, the pommel has less leverage with which to counterbalance uh, the weight of the blade. Um, now, the Starfires have the advantage that they're welded, so they're never going to get loose. They're always going to ring nicely. Um, they're a little bit more solid, <clears throat> um, beefier rounded edges. But safety-wise, I kind of have to wonder, you know, is it, would I rather be hit with something that weighs uh, a pound and a half more, uh, but is blunter, or something that weighs a pound and a half less, but is a little more sharp? Honestly, the answer, neither one. You don't want to get hit with a broadsword, a longsword of, of any type. So, uh, for my money, the control aspect of the, the lighter swords means that you're less likely to get hit in the first place. I'm probably going to go for that when I can. It does mean a little bit more maintenance and things, though. Now, even some of the, the higher-end swords that we started with, and this is a, an older Baltimore knife and sword hilt, or a sword blade, I'm guessing this hilt might be someone else, because it's not their usual construction method. I bought this one used. It might have been a Shaw. Uh, the one that I got with it was a Shaw, um, the wire hilt. But, you know, this, this is what we kind of had as an idea of what a hand and a half sword was back then. And yeah, you can certainly fit a second hand on this, but notice there's almost no space between my hands in terms of extra leverage, even if I ride the pommel. Not much room there. Um, so you've got this lovely beefy pommel that helps balance it out, but it's still just the proportions aren't as nice to me. Um, this one's actually really well weighted, uh, and it'll, it'll be solid, you know, multiple knife and sword makes great blades. Uh, it's a great stage blade, but it doesn't have quite the same feel for if you start doing some of the historical techniques. To me, this is going to give me a, a much faster, lighter, uh, I'll have more sensitivity on the Ringen am Schwert. Um, it's just a, a, a more lively feeling blade. Now, some people are going to object to the sort of stock looking hardware as being a little boring. Totally get that. So one answer to that that's come up is a company called LG Martial Arts, or for a little while they were the Printed Armory, um, has started making almost plug-and-play uh, pommels and cross guards for those of you who want to customize them. Now here's just a couple of examples of hilts I've built off of these. Um, this is some, a different cross guard with the same pommel. Uh, they come in both finished and unfinished versions. This would be the, the higher finish level, costs a little bit more. This is the lower finish level, I had to do a little bit more sanding and things, and then I, I was going to blow them anyway, so I wasn't too worried about it. I kind of like the look of the blued furniture on that. Um, and, you know, these, these grips and, and hilts, things I made myself. Um, so that can give you a little bit more of a sense of customization, um, get that, that higher end sword feel. Um, now, what I will say about these, I said almost plug and play. Uh, and I don't blame LG Martial Arts for this at all, because what I've discovered is that when you get these bare blade blanks um, from Cass Hanway, they'll fit, yeah, maybe like three quarters of the way down the tang, the cross guard wheel on one blade, and maybe like one third of the way down on another, uh, which tells me the tang width is not standardized. So if you are hoping to get one of these and be able to swap out between the, the sharps and the blunts at will, just be aware that <laughs> you may or may not uh, have a little bit of either too tight on one or, or too much play in the other, um, they might not fit exactly. So that is something that you might want to consider if you're hoping to be able to just swap out blades. Now for someone like me, once I have a, a few of these in stock, my hope is that if, uh, you know, if I do have to replace a blade for some reason, chances are good I have enough different ones of these I can swap something around until I find one that fits. Um, but if you're trying to make this your one and only training sword that can do stage combat, that can do historical European martial arts, that can do cutting practice, 
may or may not fit the bill. We'll see. Uh, but I gotta say, I really do love the like of this this hardware. Uh, Jesse Belsky uh, is a, a great uh, sword artist. Uh, he's been doing a lot of good, good stuff for stage combat recently. Uh, and I know he uses a lot of these as well. Um, it's a nice shortcut to be able to uh, to get that custom look without having to spend quite as much time and therefore spend quite as much money on the final product. Now, some of you are saying, oh, that's all well and good, but Kevin, I, I don't want a broadsword because that's kind of a bullshit term. Anyway, I want a longsword because that's really what a lot of the European manuals are, are aimed at. Uh, and there's been a push within the SAFD to actually change the name from SAFD Broadsword to SAFD Longsword. Um, probably without doing much change in terms of what people's armories have, because we don't get to update our armories very often. Um, once a school has bought something, it's going to use it until it, uh, until it breaks. Um, but more to reflect the idea that, that a lot of us within the SAFD and elsewhere are starting to incorporate some of these techniques from Fiore de Liberi, from... Uh, uh, Tallhofer from uh, Ringek, from, from any of these various lineages, um, the, the German, the Italian, a little bit of some of the English, um, into our work, and that that ought to be expressed, and we ought to strive for a little more historical accuracy in, in talking about what it is that we do. So actually, the first one of these blades that I bought was a long sword blade, and this one I got straight from uh, Tinker himself when, uh, when I was in Seattle. Um, and I think I stuck an extra cross guard he had from one of the bastard swords on it, and I made this pommel with an angle grinder out of scrap steel. Took forever. Wouldn't suggest doing that again. <laughs> um, it was kind of a pain in the butt. I even made the little uh, pommel nut thing by hand, and, and it kind of was not as good, so I ended up swapping out for one of theirs. Um, and then later on, I, I got another set of hardware from LG uh, Armory, and so this would be an example of their, their uh, fishtail pommel on one of their blunt longsword blades. I don't have a sharp longsword, but... I don't do a lot with sharps. Um, so again, it's got a little bit more length, uh, but it's got a very similar blade profile to the Bastard Sword. Um, as you can see, they do have the same attention to vibration nodes. So you've got one sweet spot right about here where it's not vibrating, and another one right about where my hand is. So there's some vibration happening at the tip and here and down here, but not here and here, as it makes those those harmonic waves. Um, in terms of size, by way of comparison, and you can cheat this a little bit depending on what pommel you stick on it and how far recessed the pommel nut is, but it's really not that much difference in blade length at all. We're talking maybe, what is that, like an inch, inch and a half blade length. Can you see the tips there? Let me back up. There we go. Now you can see the tips, right? Um, so maybe a, a, an inch or an inch and a half difference in blade length. Get the light to shine on it. There we go, now you can see it, right? Um, and then about, what, a couple inches of pommel maybe? Insert jokes here about men not knowing what a couple of inches means. Um, but basically the, the most of the pommel of the long sword sticks out beyond the pommel of the bastard sword. Um, so both of these are gonna be fairly light and, and responsive, which I appreciate. Um, they do need periodic tightening up, so you got to carry a hex wrench with you at all times. If you're not used to that because you're used to the hand-tightened pommels or the, uh, the welded or the peened, um, can be a, a bit of an annoyance. But as long as you remember to throw one in your sword bag, you're fine. And then for those of you who like to do sword and buckler, uh, they also have the early medieval single-handed sword. Um, I, again, I only have blunts on these. And I only have the, the ones with the LG Martial Arts hardware. I don't have any stock ones on this. Uh, and in this case... Uh, once again, this actually these were both unfinished. I just uh, blackened this one, I, or blued this one, and I didn't blue the other one. Um, but they were both the uh, the lower line of finish on the uh, on the hilt parts. Um, as you can see, I was able to get yeah maybe like three or four centimeters more length. I actually cut some of these down a bit. I think one of these I ground down a little bit because I don't I don't like my my grips too long on single handed swords. Um, so you have some flexibility both between that and uh, how far you want to be able to crank that pommel nut down and how recessed you want it to be within the, within the pommel. Um, so again, distal taper, edge taper, slightly squared edges. I haven't used these very much, so some of these you can still kind of feel like I've rounded off a bit with some sandpaper. But if you look at it, this is the edge is flat. It's not round, it is flat, uh, which again takes a little breaking in before it's at its best, I think. These do have as all of them, a decent amount of flex and spring, because again, this is designed to be able to stick archery blunts on it, jab it into somebody wearing armor and not hurt them too much. And if you wanted to compare 
This is the uh, Cass Hanway Practical Single-Handed Sword. This is uh, eh, probably mid-generation. I'm sure it's not the most recent anymore. Kind of like the triple fuller thing they had going on there. So, you know, this one's certainly serviceable uh, for, for sword and buckler if you're doing manuscript 133 kind of stuff. Um, but this one's a little longer, a little more svelte. Uh, definitely feels a little lighter in the hand. Um, and I guess I can't really honestly compare grips because this is a stock grip and this isn't. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty sure the stock early medieval single hand sword grips are also a little less chunky than this one. And according to my cheap bathroom scale, this comes in at about two and a half pounds, something like that. Um, if we were to compare this to a Starfire LS32, which again is what a lot of us probably uh, started out on, or if you worked at an early Ren Fair or a Shakespeare Festival or something, you probably used some of these. Again, these are the vaguely sword shaped crowbars, zero taper uh, of any sort. But, they do ring nicely, being one piece welded. Um, very similar proportions, actually, almost identical. Which is kind of, kind of interesting. So you, you could pair these, I suppose. Um, and, let's see how much the Starfire comes in weight-wise. Just under three pounds for one of these. So yeah, these are... Uh, but again, the, the perception of weight is more important than the actual weight. What matters with these is not the statistics, it's how it feels in the hand. Um, and the balance on these, because of the lack of taper, uh, the center of balance is going to be much further out. Uh, and it's just going to feel a lot less alive in the hand. So this one balances... What is that? About a eh, fist and a thumb from the cross. Yeah, something like that. Lines up about with the pad on my thumb from the cross guard. And again, these are cheating a little bit because it's my custom grips and all, but let's see if I'm full of it or not. I don't know if the numbers will actually back me up. Wow, look at that. That's actually pretty interesting. This is almost exactly the same center of balance. Huh. So they will naturally want to. Uh, so these will naturally want to pivot around the same place. That's one of the things the center of balance means when you're using it. If you want to, if you're doing a, a Molinet or if you're just switching over from one side to the other, which basically is a kind of Molinet for these false edge cuts or something, um, pivoting around that center of balance is where it's going to be easiest to make it move. And it's actually the same for both of these. So apparently, what I'm trying to describe, <laughs> I don't have uh, the best way of demonstrating in terms of just numbers yet. Um, I don't know what it is. Some of it's the weight. Some of it's the weight. It's apparently not the center of balance, though. They just feel different. Um, that's really interesting. I'm going to find a new way to, to uh, uh, figure out what that is. I, I bet I could ask a Tinker or one of the other swordsmiths to help me out with that. Now, of course, the other thing that's happening in stage and film, uh, film, it's, it's already gone a little further, uh, is aluminum blades. So this would be an example of an aluminum single-handed sword. As you can tell, it doesn't shine quite as nicely. Uh, if I were better at polishing these things up, I'm sure I could make it do so. Um, similar proportions, a little shorter, both on the blade and the hilt. Um, zero distal taper. A <laughs> little bit of other taper. Um, but it is a little lighter. Yeah, this is less than two pounds. Um, which is why these have become a staple in Hollywood and have been for a while. Um, they don't tend to sound as good, make kind of a dull clack. Some higher end aluminums, if they're tightened up enough, will ring a little bit. I've got a, another post about that earlier. Um, but for the most part, these are not going to sound as good. For Hollywood, that doesn't matter because you can fully it in later. Um, and actually, for, for a lot of Hollywood now, they're, they're even moving away from aluminum. Um, you know, background players are going to be using wood or rubber blades. Uh, I was just talking with Richard Ryan this last weekend. Said on Vikings they were using a lot of bamboo blades, which is a trick that we get from uh, Hong Kong, uh, or or even the old samurai movies in Japan, the Chambara movies. Uh, it's the sort of laminated bamboo. Got some examples of that back there. I'll, uh, if you need to see them, um, but laminated bamboo, either painted or with like a foil, uh, metallic foil tape on it, something like that. Um, they make obviously a wooden clacking sound. For movies, it doesn't matter. You can fully that in later. Um, but aluminum has been getting more popular for live stage. I think people just appreciate the lightweight. Um, for me, though, it's, you know, it's, it's a trade-off. These do definitely have a, a thicker, safer edge than the steel. Um, you know, at, at least twice as thick. 
uh, which will make it a little bit safer. It is a little lighter, so the two of those together definitely does make it safer. The steel sounds a lot better, uh, at least when it's tightened up properly. Uh, the aluminum really just doesn't have a good sound. Um, but there is certainly a place for this, and I do have uh, even lighter weight, smaller aluminum swords that I use for, uh, for a lot of my youth shows and workshops and things like that. So, to sum up, um, the needs of stage combat and historical European martial arts sparring swords are similar, but not exactly the same. Um, the proportions of the tips of these blades, because they're based around Hema practitioners, are all a little bit more squared off than we'd see in most of our stage blades because we're not worried in the theater about being able to stick an archery blunt on there and not have it penetrate when we thrust through the mask. Um, I'm not too worried about that for the most part, at least for live theater. It doesn't have to look that pointy. For movies, it might be an issue, but again, for movies, you're not usually going to be using steel anyway. Um, I don't like the squared off. I think some of that's probably just laziness, trying to, to, <laughs> to not cut corners, but to... Uh, to save some money uh, on the production end in China when they're producing these. So you just have to put in a little bit of time and, and smooth those off yourself. Um, I do like the flexibility. The, the props artisan in me, the sword geek in me, really likes being able to customize these and, and stick different grips on them. I think that can be a, a fun side project to really make it your own, to have something that, that uh, you can bring to a workshop and you will know exactly which sword is yours and they don't all look the same. Um, aesthetically, for movie productions and all as well, or plays, I like it when not everybody's sword is identical. Mass production was not a thing in the same way when we were doing most of our sword fights. So unless you're trying to establish these are all Cardinals Guards or these are all members of that same group, in which case, yeah, you can have some that are the same. But I, I like having some variety. And when I see, uh, you know, a Henry V and every single character's sword looks like the exact same production model or baseline from Rogue Steel or whatever it is, eh, it bugs me mildly. I know that there's budget issues as well. But I just, I think it's nice when, at least your, your hero characters, you can give them something that's a little bit snazzier, nicer, different, um, but that still can play well with the others. And so being able to have these same blades with different hilts can be a, a nice option. Um, now, I'll be honest, I've yet to use any of these actually in a show. Uh, I've used them in a number of different workshops and classes so far, and they've held up fine for that, and they've been really popular. Everybody always loves them because they look fancy and they're nice and light. Um, and when you compare it to, for example, the Hanway Practical Hand and a Halfs, which are peened, um, because these are peened, they're never going to fly apart on you, but they will start to rattle after a while. There's a little bit of rattle in the cross guard there. And they also, they just clack. If I damp down this one, yeah, they don't make as nice a ring. Whereas, as long as you keep these tightened up, they'll ring for you. So, you know, there's, there's definitely some advantages uh, aesthetically of these over these. Now, will these... Practical hand and a half hold up in the long run just as well. I'm sure they will. Um, you know, I've had these for years. These have been in shows. These have been in classes and workshops, and they're still doing fine. These, I don't know. We'll see. Um, but it's certainly easier to change out the blade if I have to. Um, not that you ever want to have to, but it is an option. Now, if you do choose to customize these, I've got to say I am a fan of the, the custom hardware. Um, the only one that I'm a little iffy about, I really love the look of these fishtail pommels, but honestly, it's just it's a little less comfy. Um, there's just too many corners and things to my mind. I like to really ride this pommel just to, to maximize the, the leverage and flexibility when I'm, when I'm doing sword work. <laughs> Low ceilings here in a small space. Um, so to me, I would rather have uh, a wheel pommel or um, a globulose pommel or something like that, a scent stopper, than, than something that's got too many pokey bits here. Um, yeah, maybe if I'm wearing gloves, it's less a big deal, but uh, it's just a little less comfortable. Uh, but these styles have both been fine. I do have... One more that I, I, uh, I still haven't had a chance to finish up um, that's got another style pommel. I'll uh, I look forward to being able to finish up the grip on that and see how that feels when I get it into play. Um, <laughs> you can also kind of tell I'm a fan, fan of the, the ray skin grips. I really love the feel of that. So, uh, yeah, where I am here, I'm, I'm by myself. I'm in a basement. I'm making these videos. Uh, a little harder to get into technique at the moment, um, but that gives you at least a little bit of a sense of the equipment and the difference in the equipment needs. Um, now, uh, in a couple of weeks, I will be heading up again to the Patty Crane International Workshop, which has been kind of my, my little brigadoon, my magic village that I go to to learn every couple of years. Um, it's, it's a major international stage combat workshop, which is now just taking stage combat off the title to be more inclusive of the movement and martial arts and now intimacy direction and other things that are becoming a part of that. So uh, I'll be able to, to meet some new... Um, uh, some of the historical European martial artists that I've known for, for decades now, I've been going to these for 20 years, 
uh, as well as some that I've known online for a while and have never gotten to meet, like Jess Finley. Um, so uh, it'll be a mix of them and stunt performers. The DeLongas isn't there. They're, they're also people I've known online for years and have never gotten to meet in person, um, as well as uh, you know Rick Skeen and other stunt people who I, I've known for a while. Um, <clears throat> So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I might have some reports uh, if I have a chance from there. Uh, I will be posting some videos uh, as a part of my work uh, as an intern this year at the Patty Crane Workshop. So keep an eye open for those. I'm not sure exactly what account those will go on, but we'll see. Um, I'll be doing mostly firearm stuff, I think, while I'm there, it sounds like, as we throw the schedule together, but uh, also an intro to long sword class uh, that I'll be co-teaching. That'll be fun. Uh, so, uh, there might be a little bit of a hiatus here over the holidays while I disappear to Canada for a couple of weeks and then madly scramble to get my things ready for another semester at Case Western in Cleveland Playhouse. But hopefully this will uh, be a little treat for you for the holidays and something to get you through, especially as you start thinking about maybe how to spend some of those holiday checks or uh, other new toys you might want to acquire over the coming year. As always, stay safe, look good doing it, and I'll talk to you next time.